in Genesis chapter 37. Verse 18 and 19, the Bible says of Joseph's brothers, and they saw him from a distance. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer comes. And these are his brothers speaking. Come now, let us kill him, and cast him into a pit. And we will say some wild beast hath destroyed him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. How dreams come true, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I want the Holy Spirit to give me more than human wisdom to communicate to you from a biblical perspective how you can make your dreams come true. When I was eight years old, I lived in a public housing project. My mother was a domestic, a maid, scrubbing floors for six dollars a day. One day, the woman for whom she worked gave her a a record, and she brought it home. And because it was the only record in the house, I started playing over and over again. It was not music, it was a sermon by a man with a strange voice. He said, the morning sun had been up for some hours over the city of Davis. <laughs> That's the way he sounded. Pilgrims and visitors were pouring in through the gates, mingling with merchants from villages round about. Shepherds were coming down from the hills, and the narrow streets were crowded. It was the only record I kept playing. All of the aged stooped with ears, muttering to themselves as they pushed through the throng. There were children playing in the streets, calling to each other in shrill voices. There were those carrying birds, baskets of vegetables, cast of wine, water bags. There were tradesmen with their tools. I said to myself, this guy is not from the neighborhood. <laughs> but I kept playing the record over and over again until I had memorized both sides. Were you there and compromised in Egypt? Eight years old, in a rat-infested public housing project, an eight-year-old memorized two sermons. What I did not know was that I was memorizing the sermon of a man named the sermons of a man named Peter Marshall, the fifty-sixth chaplain of the United States Senate. <laughs> At eight years old. But the sovereign God of the universe had a plan for my life. even as he has a plan for your life. And God has a way of leaving markers along the way so that when his will is done, we will know it was not because we were so smart or so talented. But as Lionel Harris sings, you were in it after all. When I was eight years old, I am absolutely convinced that God intended for me to become the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate. 
And I can imagine Gabriel, when God brought that up, Gabriel said, but Lord, he's African-American. And God said, you need that to be Gabriel. And Gabriel may have also pointed out, but Lord, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. God said, you let me handle that, Gabriel. Well, the book Education reminds us higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Ladies and gentlemen, if you only knew how high God wanted to take you, it would astound you. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you. The sovereign God of the universe thinks about you and me. And he says, I want to prosper you. I want you to be the head and not the tail. I want you to be above and not beneath. I want to bless you in the city. I want to bless you in the field. I want to bless you when you're going out. I want to bless you when you're coming in. I want you to rise upon the high places of the earth. I want to feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. I want to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I went to a mechanic to get my car fixed, and he didn't do a good job, so I took it back. And he said, I'm done with it. I, I don't care what you say. I said, well, at least give me my money. I'm, I'm not giving you anything back. I'm done with you. I said, you don't understand to whom you are speaking, do you? He said, I, I know you're an admiral, and I'm not intimidated by that. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, an admiral is the least of your problems. I said, you are speaking to a born-again, Holy Ghost-filled child of God. He said, I don't care who you are, get out of my brain and you shop. I said, is, is that your final answer? <laughs> I left his shop, I don't know what kind of whipping the Lord put on him, but he called me two days later and said, come get your blankety blank money. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, 20 says God wants to do for you and me immeasurably, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine. According to his power, working in and through us, if you can think it, God's plan is bigger than that. And so in our scripture lesson, a teenager by the name of Joseph was a dreamer. <laughs> Thank God for dreamers. But you need to be careful to whom you tell your dreams. Because there are spiritual player haters. You gotta ask the brother, what does it mean? What is player there? What is player there? Somebody will explain that to you. That's uh, a little ebonic going on there. I am, I, like, like Pastor Roman, I am bilingual. <laughs> and Joseph, naively, and probably with a little bit of pride and arrogance, came to his brothers and said, I had a dream last night, guys. Do you want to hear about it? And you remember, Joseph's mother was who? Rachel. 
Rachel was so beautiful that Jacob started crying the day he met her. Now that's a pretty woman. <laughs> there are many men who cry after they meet you. <laughs> but here was a woman who was so beautiful he cried the day he met her. Genesis 29, 20 says, And Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days. Because of the love he had for her, girlfriend had it going on. In fact, when I get to heaven after I see Jesus, the next person I want to see is Rachel. Not Daniel, not Shadrach, not, I want to see Rachel. I want to see a woman that a man can work seven years and it seems like a, I got a few days, I want to meet Rachel. <laughs> Joseph looked like his mother. Now, Rachel had a sister named Leah. Leah, the Bible said, was tender eyed. Leah was uh, probably what some folk would call cross eyed. No? You say, why are you looking at me like that? And she said, I'm not looking at you. I mean, you know, with one of those kind of deals. <laughs> and Rachel could not have children, but Leah was cranking them out every nine months, and they were looking just like her. <laughs> so here is Joseph walking around, looking like Denzel Washington. With his pretty coat of many colors on, up there talking about, I had a green guy. And he had Leah's children, and Leah's handmaid's children. They hated him because of his dreams. Be careful to whom you tell your dreams. Love sees from afar. But so does faith. They see him at a distance and they declare. Genesis 37 19, behold, the dreamer comes. Come now, let us kill him and cast him into a pit, and we will say a wild beast hath destroyed him. And we will see what will become of his dream. Don't miss out on God's dream for your life. Don't settle for less than God's best for your life. If you're going to make your dreams come true, you must first of all stay in the will of God. You must do what? Stay in the will of God. The 37th Psalm says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will do what? Give you the desires of your heart. There are many people who believe that that means if you praise the Lord and you delight yourself in the Lord, then whatever you want, God will give it to you. But that is not true, because there are some things we want that we don't need. James and John's mother came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 20. She was Jesus' aunt. And she said, son, we believe you are about to make your move. And when you set up your kingdom, I want you to make sure that Jimmy is on your right hand and John is on your left. Matthew chapter 20. And Jesus said to her, you don't know what you're asking for. When the Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart, it means that if you delight yourself in the will of God, he will plant the desires in your heart so that his desires will become your desires. That is desiring to be in the will of God. In Gethsemane, our blessed Lord looked into that cup and prayed, let thy will be done. 
But what Jesus saw in that cup was so astonishing that he said, Father, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. For what our blessed Savior saw was separation from the Father. And what our blessed Savior saw was the fact that he would become sin for us. He would become all of the pathology of the Charles Mansons of the planet, all of the sickness of the Ted Bundy of the planet. He became sin for the entire world. He died for our past, present, and future sins. When Jacqueline Black sins, God is not surprised. He does not turn to Gabriel and say, I am shocked. That Dr. Barry Black, the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate, would do something like that. Oh no, he said to feed us before the rooster grows twice. You will deny me three times. But I love you anyway. And when you are converted, strengthen your brothers and sisters. Our Lord looked into that cup. It was not the nails that killed him. It was not the crown of thorns pressed upon his head that brought him the most pain. That appalling cry of dereliction and desolation that he uttered from the cross. Amy, Amy, Lama Sabahani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was separation from the Father that broke the heart of the Son of God. And yet he prayed, keep me in the circle of your will. Let your will be done. When I was a young man, I prayed one night, Lord, if you will let me grow up and one day make $100 a week, I will never ask you for anything else for as long as I live. Aren't you glad God does not always answer your prayers? If he had cast me out at $100 a week, how many of you know, Houston, we would have a serious problem today? If you want me to drink some truth, one stay in the will of God. I want what God wants for me. Because if it's what God wants, it will be the sweetest thing that you can experience. If you're going to make your dreams come true, number two, refuse to procrastinate. You've got to learn how to seek God early in life. Seek God early in the day. Don't procrastinate about spiritual things. Major in spiritual things, minor in everything else. Luke 18 an amazing man came to Jesus. Number one, he was rich. But there are a lot of people who are rich, but they are so old that they know that somebody else will spend their money. But this young man was not only rich, he was young. So he had time to spend money. There are youthful old who are rich, but they have no prestige, they have no position. He was rich, young, and a ruler. Luke chapter 18, everything the heart could possibly want, money, youth, and power. And yet he had a hole in his life. And he came to Jesus and said, something is missing. What lack I yet? And Jesus, the divine physician, wrote a prescription. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And the young man put it off. 
He procrastinated. Who knows? He may have been what the Apostle Paul became. We don't even know his name because he did not follow the dream of Christ for his life. He procrastinated. Perhaps later on he came to Christ. I don't know. But he procrastinated. Refused to procrastinate if you're going to make your dreams come true. Number three, if you're going to make your dreams come true, deal with envy and jealousy. When God blesses you, someone is not going to like it. In fact, the litmus test of whether you are living right, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, is whether you are persecuted. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, Yea, all those who live godly will suffer persecution. They call Jesus a wine bibber and a sinner, a glutton. He hangs out in the wrong places. Joseph's brothers hated him. They were envious of him. Deal with it. Do not let it deter you from being all that God wants you to be. I love the story of David. Teenager shows up on the battlefield with some veggie burger sandwiches for his brother. That's what it says in the Hebrew. <clears throat> he shows up on the battlefield and he hears this giant, nearly ten feet tall, giving forth his bellicose rhetoric. The anointing of God is already on there. Remember, he's already been set apart by God. God has already told him, you are going to be the successor of King Saul. My anointing is already on you. And one of the reasons why David knew he could fight Goliath and win is because he already knew the promises of God that he would be king and God didn't say he would be a dead king. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should cry out against the armies of the living God? Eliab, David's brother, said, I know why you're here. There's always going to be some spiritual play ahead. I know why you're here. And who's taking care of those few sheep back home? You get your little self back. David said, is there not a cause? Matthew chapter 5 says, Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Make sure it's a falsehood. You're not blessed if they're telling the truth. Falsely for my sake, rejoice! Be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. I am the only African American admiral in the 230 year history of the Navy Chaplain Corps. And when it was time for me to be selected, there were people who were envious because the selection board looked at 169 captains. And linearly, I was number 168. So here's a list with 167 people senior to me. But favor isn't fair. Favor <laughs> isn't fair. I had only been to the Pentagon twice in my life. So the third time I walked into the Pentagon, I was mad. And I said to a lieutenant, do you know where the E-ring is? And he looked at me and said, sir, you're an admiral. 
I said, I understand that. He said, well, of course you know. Is this a joke? You know where the E-ring is. I said, son, this is only my third time in the Pentagon. You see, favor isn't bad. I started getting ugly emails. Anonymous emails. My first name did not begin with a B, it began with an N. Ugly things. The only, why, the only reason why you are an admiral is because of this and because of that. And I thought to myself, well, why did it take so long? Over 200 years. Is that it? <laughs> but to each email, to each indication of Indian jealousy, I would type back, just I didn't know, my brother or sister, I didn't know what I was dealing with here, continue to pray for me as I pray for you. But then by the way, rejoice and be, I acted like they had given me a compliment. And got ugly and ugly. There is no way in the world you will ever get a second star. You may have one star, but you will never get a second star. And you, my brother or my sister, continue to pray for me as I pray for you. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus be with you. When I got my second star, there is no way in the world you will finish with honor. I don't know how you got the second star, but there's no way you're going to... My brother or sister, the Lord bless you. Keep on praying for me. I appreciate your prayers in Jesus' name. And then three months before I could retire as a two-star admiral in the Navy, I was appointed the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate, and the email changed. It said, you are the luckiest person in the whole world. Oh, uh, 23rd Psalm says, I'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God will set a table with the finest linen and the best food, and then he'll put seats around it and make your enemies sit down and watch you hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You gotta learn how to deal with the envy and deal with the jealousy that's all around you and rejoice when you are persecuted when you know you are in the will of God. If you're gonna make your dreams come true, you must also take some risk. You will never walk on water if you stay in the boat. <laughs> In all of recorded history, there are only two people who walked on water, two human beings. Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who could do it routinely. And Peter, old fast talking Peter, Peter, who put his mouth in motion before he put his brain in gear. Peter walked on, say what you want to about it. The brother walked on some water. He did the impossible. You must take risks. Joseph took risks. When he walked into the home of Potiphar, Potiphar's wife said to him, Is it hot in here or is it just me? That's what it says in the Hebrew. And girlfriend started hitting on Jonah every chance she got. But hear me. Hear me. Obedience brings its own blessings. The fifth Psalm, verse 12, says the righteous are surrounded with the shield of God's favor. God puts a hedge around the righteous. And Joseph wouldn't even go in the house when he knew Mrs. Porterworth. Is she in there? I'll come back another time. <laughs> You've got to avoid the neighborhood of sin. You've got to have what I call an honor mentality. 
And you know, Arnold is a little guy on a television program many years ago called Different Strokes. He had a brother named Willis. Willis was always trying to get Arnold into trouble. But when Willis would even hint about doing something wrong, Arnold would say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> you got to have that kind of attitude, and you got to step out of the boat. Joseph knew when he left his coat with Mrs. Portifer. I'm not going back to get that coat. He knew he was taking a risk. This was evidence. She could say anything. You got to trust God. When I decided to enter the Navy Chaplain Corps, every preacher in this church, just about, that I knew told me it's the biggest mistake you will ever make. Why are you doing in the military? God is blessing your work. You are baptizing souls. You are leaving the ministry, boy. General conference people were telling me, but I took some risk and I stepped out of the boat and I entered uncharted career waters. And when I became an admiral, those very ministers said, I encouraged the boy. It's all right. I called the selective and me. I told him, I told him the military is way out of me. The Holy Spirit impressed me. Go in the military car. The parable of Matthew chapter 25. To some he gave five, to some he gave two, to some he gave one. But the ones who increased their talents were willing to take risks. It was the guy with one who said, I can't risk this one. So I'm going to bury it in the earth so that I will have it. And many of us miss realizing our dreams because of our failure to step out of our comfort zone, to step out of the goal, to let go and trust God because his dream for you is bigger than anything you can imagine. Okay, let's see how well you're taking notes. See if we got some good students. If you're going to make your dream come true, your number one got to do what? You want to be in your world. If you're going to make your dream come true, number two, you got to do what? Okay, get to it early. If you're going to make your dream come true, number three, you got to do what? Spiritual plan is around. Okay? If you're going to make your dream come true, number four, you must do what? Finally, if you're going to make your dream come true, you've got to trust the providence of God. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct you. Joseph trusted the providence of God. How do we know? Wherever he went, he never panicked. Wherever he went, he was never upset. Robert Louis Stevenson said, to travel, hopefully, is better than arrive. You've got to learn how to enjoy the journey. You see, knowing Jesus as your Savior brings eternal life in the here and the now. Eternal life starts now. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. The joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. So you can trust this providence whether you're in the pit Praise the Lord. First Thessalonians 5. In everything, give thanks. Whether you're sold to a band of Ishmaelites on your way to Egypt, praise the Lord. Whether you're standing on an auction block about to be bought by Potiphar, praise the Lord. Whether Mrs. Potiphar is hitting on you or not, praise the Lord. And then Joseph ends up in prison. And you would think, in prison on trumped up of rape charges, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in jail isn't guilty. 
chapter of Genesis spoke in jail. Joseph is in jail, and you would have thought he was in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> Morning, walking through that jail. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. With you in mind, with Hello Bucket, Hello Baker. Why are you back today? The one that he didn't get killed in a prison acting like that. Why? The Lord was with him, and he trusted the providence of God. And it was that attitude. Because remember, when they took them the dream, how much time did the butler and the baker have left when they told their dream to Joseph? Three days. Was a small window? Three days. You will be restored. You will be killed. Trust the providence of God. Come here, Paul and Silas, and talk to this church. And hear Paul say, I was in jail. They beat Silas and me. And we, we knew it was unfair, but we trusted the providence of God. And so around midnight, even though I was bleeding in that subterranean cell, I turned to Silas and said, I don't know about you, but I feel like praising the Lord. We trusted the providence of God so much that we started singing the psalms for the psalms from the hymn book of the early church. And in that prison with rats running around, we sang, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that he meditate. We sang him number two. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a thing thing against the Lord and against his anointing. We sang him 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom then shall I be afraid? We sang him 121. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And because our God inhabits praise, when we started praising him, heaven got happy. I believe God must have started patting his feet because the Bible says heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. The earth started shaking. The chains fell off. And our dreams were realized. The Apostle Paul toward the end, all oh, did he have his dream fulfilled. Second Timothy chapter four. I am now ready to be offered. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. Finished my course, kept the faith. Here's the dream henceforth that is laid up for me. Crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearance. Trust the My sisters and brothers, more than one million adults left Egypt heading for the dream of the promise of the more than one million adults who left Egypt, headed for the promised land, only two of them made it in. Only two made the dream come true. Not even most, but he made it in. Caleb and Joshua. I am determined That if only two people make it into heaven, <laughs> Dr. Barry C. Black, the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate, will be covered with the blood and the robe of the righteousness of Christ. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going through. I'm going through. I'll pay the price. No matter what else others do, I'll stake my claim with the Lord's divine 
I've started with Jesus. And I'm going through. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Somebody say hallelujah in this place. Somebody say thank you, Jesus, in this place. Somebody say glory to God in this place. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, thank you that your dream is far greater than anything that we can imagine for our lives. Thank you, O oh God, that you are willing and able to make our dreams come true. O oh God, We've got people who do not feel satisfied being in your will because your will sometimes takes them through Gethsemane and the Calvary. Yes. We've got people who are procrastinating and even though they hear your voice, they put it off for a more convenient season like the rich young ruler. Oh God, we've got folks who are becoming discouraged because of the envy and the jealousy around them instead of rejoicing and being exceedingly glad. And then, Lord, we've got folks who want the dream, but it seems too risky. And so they stay in the comfort of the boat. And then, God, there are others who just won't trust your providence. To believe that you are omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent and that you, O oh God, cannot and will not fail. O oh God, this day, empower us to make our dreams come true. And may we realize that the first step is confessing you with our lips and believing in our hearts that Calvary is all about us because you died for our sins. How dreams come true, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I want the Holy Spirit to give me more than human wisdom to communicate to you from a biblical perspective how you can make your dreams come true. When I was eight years old, I lived in a public housing project. My mother was a domestic, a maid scrubbing floors for six dollars a day. One day the woman for whom she worked gave her a, a record and she brought it home. And because it was the only children playing in the streets, calling to each other in shrill voices, all those carrying birds, baskets of vegetables, cast of wine, water bags. There were tradesmen with their tools. I said to myself, this guy is not from the neighborhood. <laughs> but I kept playing the record over and over again until I had memorized both sides. Were you there and compromised in Egypt? Eight years old, in a rat-infested public housing project, an eight-year-old memorized two sermons. What I did not know was that I was memorizing record in the house. I started playing over and over again. It was not music, it was a sermon by a man with a strange voice. He said, the morning sun had been up for some hours over the city of David. 
That's the way he's done. Pilgrims and visitors were pouring in through the gates, mingling with merchants from villages round about. Shepherds were coming down from the hills, and the narrow streets were crowded. It was the only record I kept playing. Out of the aged stooped with ears, muttering to themselves as they pushed through the throng. Now I think the sermon of a man named the sermons of a man named Peter Marshall, the fifty-sixth chaplain of the United States Senate. <laughs> At eight years old. But the sovereign God of the universe had a plan for my life. <laughs> Even as he has a plan for your life. And God has a way of leaving markers along the way. So that when his will is done, we will know it was not because we were so smart or so talented. But as Lionel Harris sings, you were in it after all. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 18 and 19, the Bible says of Joseph's brothers, and they saw him from a distance. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer comes. And these are his brothers speaking. Come now, let us kill him, and cast him into a pit. And we will say some wild beast hath destroyed him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. 